the narrative concerning manna in Exodus chapter 16 is pretty familiar in a lot of ways. And I think there's a tendency as we come to these familiar passages to be a little bit negative toward the people of Israel. This time though, I kept wondering how much like them we can often be. When faced with a crisis and a need that seemed impossible to overcome, faith was not their starting point. And to me that's challenging from the get-go. Is our first thought when we're faced with a big problem, some major obstacle in our lives, is it faith? I, I keep trying to look at where I have been recently and to evaluate that in my own life. In dealing with struggle, is faith our beginning point? Or are we like Israel? Do we get upset and panic and complain and then try to come up with our own solution? How far down the list do we have to get before faith begins to come into play? And I, I have to admit, I love how beautifully intense the doom and gloom statements of Israel can be. They're good at it. They are the epitome of drama queen. They basically say God could have just killed us in Egypt where we will, were well fed instead of walking us all the way out here into the wilderness to kill us the slow way by starvation. Couldn't he have at least killed us quickly? And, and they express the depth of their need with negative assumptions about the character of God. They describe the miracle that is their deliverance from slavery in Egypt as being a premeditated murder attempt. And God doesn't get angry about that. And I'm really amazed at the grace of God. He doesn't get angry. He just feeds them. He gives them meat and bread. And when that bread came though, and it came as needed, but it didn't come as expected. It was what they needed, but they didn't recognize it. Hence the name, mon or mona, um, or as we say it, manna, meaning simply the name itself means what is it? And sometimes we may not know what we actually need. And when it comes, we may not recognize what it actually is. Manna, when we come to passages, especially this passage, it's usually something we bring up when we want to talk about how God provides and how faithful God can be. But maybe there's also a point here in this passage that it shows how we can actually fail to recognize what God is providing or how God is trying to provide to meet our deepest needs. And Moses in the wilderness with the children of Israel wasn't the only one to face this problem. Jesus faced it too. And that's what we're looking at. John chapter 6 verses 24 through 35. It's going to be on the screen if you want to follow along. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You know, the people have not understood what Jesus was all about. And despite that, 
we have to admit, they were definitely still willing to follow him around. And they didn't know where he was or when he had left from the side, that particular side of the Sea of Galilee. So they go back to Capernaum to look for him because that is the place that most of the time where he has been headquartered. It is where Peter and his family lived on the shore of Galilee. So they have heard his teaching. They have eaten the bread and the fish that we talked about last week. Jesus is just frustrated that they keep wanting to talk about the most insignificant stuff. That's his point. You aren't here because you saw God's power at work. You're here because you got to eat a lot of food. They haven't yet begun to move past their physical need toward their spiritual need. And even their physical question that they ask him needs a spiritual answer. They ask him, when did you come here? Meaning, how did you get across the lake? But they need to wrestle spiritually with the when and why of Jesus coming into the world. They're chasing short-term goals in the face of eternal opportunity. They need to move beyond the bread and the fish to the faith meal that he wants to offer them. As one writer put it, they have been filled, but they have not been fulfilled. They weren't finding something to fill their hearts and change their lives. They were willing to work so hard for earthly stuff, but they weren't learning the work that you have to do to get the eternal stuff. And he tells them that work isn't all that complicated. It's defined by Jesus simply as believing in him. And their reply to his challenge is to ask for more miracles. And maybe we shouldn't be surprised that Jesus connects this crowd to the miraculous meal from the day before. They're the ones who followed him. And they bring up Moses in the manna. It's like they're asking for a repeat of the previous day's all-you-can-eat buffet. And the last phrase of verse 30 says it all. Jesus says their work is to believe. They ask, what work will you do to earn our belief? But Jesus insists that their use of Moses and manna is just another example of how they keep failing to see the point. Moses didn't give manna. God gave manna. God gave bread to meet an, an earthly need, which should have led people to believe and to follow and to trust in God. Jesus has already done the same thing through the power of God when he fed them the day before. And now there's another opportunity for God to give them bread, but this bread is not for Israel in the wilderness, but for the heart hunger of the entire world. And they claim that they want that bread, and then he says to them simply, it's him. He says, I am. The two words which are never simple in John's gospel. God said to Moses way back in Exodus chapter 3, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. These short words are the name by which God identifies himself to his people. And Jesus, in saying those two words, applies the name of God to himself. As this chapter progresses, we will see this is the moment when he says those two words, when things will begin to move toward trouble in this interaction. Seven times in the book of John, Jesus will apply the name of God to himself. And many will not take this well. As he pushes them to move beyond thinking about their physical needs and desires, the desire they have for deliverance from Rome, their concern for physical food, he wants them to see that even when God meets a physical need, heals a physical hurt, delivers from a physical problem, God is working to move them into a spiritual relationship. And, and it's not that different from the manna. The needs of the people were being met, but they couldn't recognize it for what it was. They kept referring to the food as a question. What is it? It wasn't what they expected. It wasn't what they were looking for. And they found Jesus to be just as confusing as bread in the wilderness. He wasn't easy to follow. He didn't cooperate with their plans for him. He didn't meet their needs on demand. But he claimed still to be the food that they really needed. But they were still struggling to recognize it. They had been filled the day before, but they were not being fulfilled by what Jesus offered. They appreciated the food that filled a short-term need, but they weren't yet looking to him for a long-term filling of the heart. It, there's a writer named Benjamin Sparks. He said, it's really difficult. Jesus comes, or Jesus says that those who come to him will never be hungry, and those who put their trust in him will never thirst. But it's a hard saying for those who have everything and need nothing. 
accept the one thing they may not be aware that they need, to be transformed by faith in Jesus. Sometimes people are so lost in their physical needs that they come to church or they come to God and they're just looking to get a short-term need met, to get a problem solved. And after that, they just tend to drift away. But it can be even, maybe as hard or even harder for people who don't feel like they have any needs because they have a lot in their life and maybe they fail to even be aware of any kind of a spiritual need in their hearts or any need for a change in their deepest selves. We can be so filled with things that we fail to even be aware of our need for something deeper, for fulfillment. And if we fail to be aware of our need, we can miss out. We have so many appetites that we can fill with so many things. And the available resources to fill the hungers of our lives are increasing by leaps and bounds every day. And, and it just raises the question, do we still have time? Do we still have room in our hearts to still have some hunger left over for more of Jesus? I asked earlier how fast we turn to faith in a crisis. But there's a danger that we could fill our lives with so much stuff that we never turn to faith in Jesus at all. We will wake up and consume everything that the world offers and be consumed by everything the world offers until we go to bed. And the, then we will repeat that daily until our lives are gone. Jesus offers something better to fill our hearts and to transform our lives if we still have any appetite left to give to him. We sing it at Christmas, let every heart prepare him room. We need to prepare him some room. And we need to protect the space we give Jesus in our hearts and lives every day and always. It is so easy in this world full of entertainment and activities and stuff to fill ourselves up to where we have nothing left for God. And we can be so busy and so filled that we're not even aware of the problem until we come to the end and our lives are gone. Let's make sure we make room for him and we guard that room to make sure we never push him out. Can we pray together? Lord, lead us to your table as we seek you and we seek to be filled with more of you. God, we are all struggling to live and to grow and to function in a culture in a time where there are so many things available to us, calling out to us, crying for our time and our energy and our hearts. God, I don't think we need guilt. I don't know that we need conviction, but we may need somehow for you to make us aware of how much you love us and how much we miss when we don't make room to let that love in. So God, would you knock on our hearts? Would you challenge us? Would you confront us by just showing us how much you love us? Make us so aware of your love that we wouldn't want to turn it down or push it away. And as we come seeking you at your table this morning, awaken us anew to your presence, to your love, to your grace to the peace that only you can bring, to the contentment we will only know if we have you. Help us to seek you this morning as we come to your table and help us to find you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. It's funny how I, I think every time I've heard that in my life, I thought of things that hold you as problems and struggles and challenges. And then I think for the first time, or, or hurts or brokenness, whatever, I think the first time today when I heard it, I thought, how many things hold our lives that aren't necessarily bad? They're just consuming so much of us that we don't have much left over. But if we give that to Jesus too, that he, he just makes it all right and puts it all where it needs to be and it all comes together. Um, that we want him to have the good and the bad or the bad and the good, depending on how you look at it. We give it all to him and he makes it right. His body was broken for us that we might be connected to life and filled up with love. Take and eat and invite Jesus to take his full place in your heart.
His blood was shed for us. That we might be washed clean and made new. Take and drink. And invite the Lord to clean up any corners that might need a fresh touch of his love today. God, thank you for abundant grace, infinite mercy, amazing love, continual presence, and just the way you sustain us through whatever each day may bring. Help us to keep you as Lord of our hearts, Lord of our lives, and help us never to push you away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to end with a couple of verses. from Ephesians 4 and make it our blessing for this week. The words will be on the screen if you want to follow along. Paul writes, We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. To make that our blessing for this week. May you mature in your faith and find that your understanding of Jesus has given you a relationship with him that stands unshakably upon a solid rock. May we learn together how to let our faith express itself with the heart of our Lord in a way that will also continually work to deepen our unity as a body. Finally, may we become ever better at living that unity toward others by the way we welcome them into this church with kindness and grace. Thank you. You're dismissed.